Hi again, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act Two, the user manual for the second half of your life. And my fellow traveler, Art Kirsch, and I are with John Mariani, the virtual gourmet. John, great to see you. Good to be back on. Hi, John. I have a question for Hello. you, because you you know food of all types. Uh, and uh, while if you, you go to the johnmariani.com, you'll see all these wonderful plates of uh, steaks and various kinds of lamb uh, chops and, and fish and what have you. Uh, but as you know, uh, I've pretty much adopted in, in these later years, having grown up in New York on corned beef and rice sandwiches, uh, to be fair, uh, a more of a plant-based, uh, uh, pretty close to vegan uh, diet. And um, I'm okay with that. I mean, I really, there's lots of things for me to enjoy, not just the faux meats and the faux eggs that they're coming up with, which are quite frankly, a lot closer to uh, taste as I remember growing up. But uh, I, there, my, we go out to eat and there are two go-to restaurants for me that I know I can always find something that will make me, first of all, feel comfortable uh, with my uh, dietary choice and uh, have a good meal. And that would be, uh, 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 Mexican and Indian restaurants. And mm -hmm. um, can you, uh, and I've begun to experiment, particularly with the Indian restaurants, with things like turmeric and, and things like that, things I've never really played with before in my normal meals at home. Can you talk uh, to Indian food and, and why it might be good or not good, or what are the really fine dishes in Indian food that I might want to try yeah. to play with? Sure. Um, not unlike just about every other ethnic cuisine, uh, certainly Italian, certainly Mexican, a um, um, number of others, um, it takes a form which becomes very, very popular so that Americans think that this is the way this food should taste, often based on very, very outdated ideas of what this, these various foods should taste like. Some of uh, the dishes um, are not even not even Italian or Mexican or Chinese anywhere. I mean, you know, the stuff you get at Panda Express at the uh, at the airport is not going to really show Chinese cuisine at its best. Uh, Indian food <clears throat> comes out of a long tradition of having been dominated by the British, as we know. And it was not an independent uh, country until, what, 1949, 1950. Um, it is a subcontinent. It is not a, just a country. It is a subcontinent. If you cut it away, it would be probably as big as uh, Australia. Um, and it is a very, very, very varied place. Um, there are hundreds of languages, there are hundreds of religions, and there are hundreds of geographic and, and hundreds of geographical sections, which eat the food of this entire subcontinent. So they are all, all eating the same food. Um, add to that the fact that it was not until the 17th century that Indians ever saw a chili pepper. So you think, oh, Indian food, whoa, that's that's hot stuff, that lamb vindaloo. Uh, the chili pepper, as I've said before, uh, came from the Americas and uh, was not in any other country in the world until the 17th century when the, the Portuguese brought it, brought it to Goa and, and so forth. Okay, so let's think about Italian food without the tomato, which came from America, and Indian food without the chili pepper. Okay, let's start there. Well, <clears throat> by the time the British make it their colony, Astonishing! This little teeny, teeny island up here off the coast of Ireland completely dominates this subcontinent for uh, well over a hundred years. They, uh, what was called, uh, was called the Raj when they were there, and they um, took some of their own ideas about British food and were adopted local ingredients. So this is where curry. Curry is not a heinous word to an Indian, but the curry that you would find in the usual, quote, curry house, which is what most Indian restaurants in America are, is really British curry. Okay? It's made with a curry powder and you put um, sweet mango uh, um, uh, on the side, relish on the side. And mulligatawny soup is probably from English origins. And a number of things like that um, are not wholly Indian. The next thing to be said is that before the British, 
uh, most of India, especially in the uh, in the north uh, west, was controlled by the Mong not the Mongols, the Mughals, who we who the Persian Empire, the Mughal Empire, the Punjabi Empire, who brought their kind of Middle Eastern cuisine uh, within the royal families, especially using enormously rich, rich ingredients and lots of spices from the Middle East, which again came to dominate in the Indian restaurants that we now found in America. So you'll see Mughal pork, not not pork, we'll get to that in a moment. You'll see Mughal pork because, well, well, the Mughals don't eat pork, whereas the many, many Indians do, but many, many Indians do not eat beef. So you see, you're mixing things up. Um, but that rich, rich korma with the cottage cheese and everything was very much from the Mughal tradition. So much so that the richest dish I ever had in my entire life that I could not eat for 24 hours afterwards was in a vegetarian restaurant in Jaipur, the pink city. And we went to this well-known vegetarian restaurant. The, the cream they use, the yogurt, was so rich, I mean, it was like Carvel ice cream, you know, saucer of ice cream, and the butter, which is called ghee, which is clarified butter. It was every single vegetable from okra to spinach, delicious food, absolutely stunningly beautiful, wonderful food, but we couldn't eat for another. My wife and I couldn't eat for another day. That's how we felt. We, we canceled dinner, we got up the next morning and had a cup of coffee, and, and, and it was... Remarkable. Uh, so that's a different time. Then you get to places like Goa, which is on the coast, which is influenced by the Portuguese, which they were the great traders in Goa. Goa being on the coast is mainly seafood. So that's where you're going to get the great crab dishes and seafood dishes. They don't serve a lot of, a lot of um, uh, uh, seafood in the interior cities. Um, <clears throat> so then there's Delhi. Uh, Delhi has always been a predominant city, along with Bombay, now called Mumbai. And as with all immigrants, where did most of the Indians come from? The Italians came from the south. You know, the Germans came from certain parts of Germany. Um, and uh, the Chinese came from Canton, largely. Well, it, were the it was the people around Delhi who brought their own kind of food, specifically, and uh, their uh, biryani rice dishes, which is kind of a royal, royal dish, uh, their own spices. And they opened up New Delhi-style uh, restaurants, and so much so that in New York, uh, around Lexington Avenue, and, the, and the, the streets, the 30s, 34th Street, 35th Street, 36th Street, that's called Little Delhi, D-E-H-L-E-L-I. Uh, -E -E <clears throat> and uh, Queens, uh, the borough of Queens, is just teeming with uh, whole neighborhoods of Indians, now from different places, places, not specifically Delhi. So, I mean, to characterize Indian cuisine as any one thing is, uh, is a, a mind-blowing exercise because it's even even more diverse, I would say, than China, which is a, a, a country with uh, many, many regions, but not that many types of cuisines. But um, if you go to Kerala, if you go to Mumbai, if you go to Goa, if you go to Azra, you're going to get different types of greens, cuisines, especially if you move into the north, where it's going to more resemble the food of Nepal and and uh, the mandarins and manchu and so forth um so when you go to how do you judge an indian restaurant um go in take a look at the menu and see what the specials are and ask where the cook is from where the chef is from and now this is not foolproof because he may not make any of the food that he grew up with but you no, know, this is the new best thing if you watch television at all any good food show or if Bon Appetit or Food and Wine magazine is giving out its awards uh, for best, it's likely to be a small Indian restaurant or an Indonesian one. It's a small Indian restaurant <clears throat> with maybe 15 tables run by a woman who grew up making her mother's food from Kerala. Um, so those are the types of cuisines which are getting out there and becoming much more, more inventive. There's a restaurant here called Tagmo here in New York, which is run by LGBTQ, did I miss any, um, women, all women, and they bring the food of their regions 
uh, specifically. So there's not a single thing on that menu. You know, you're not going to find anything called uh, lamb curry uh, or, or uh, that's a, every single dish is different. So you really have to ask, well, what's in this? And this is I've never tasted anything like this before. So I hope to see in the future more and more of those kinds of restaurants. But um, my first Indian restaurant experience was in the Lower East Side when me and some college friends went there and um, uh, there was Indian restaurant down there on, on Second Avenue and uh, across from a burlesque house. And I remember saying, I don't know, as I had the curry and said, hey, this is really good. But it was traditional curry, just with curry powder and a cockroach climbing up the wall. I didn't like that at all. Didn't like that one bit because I didn't know if it was headed for the kitchen or uh, <laughs> outdoors. So the, the, uh, that was not part of that was not part of the uh, uh, the food. Well, it wasn't that, on the menu. It wasn't on the menu. Okay. And the breads, oh, Indian breads, those puffy, seared, yeasty breads made in a tandoori oven. The naans, which are often stuffed, and paratha and puri, which they put a little ball of uh, dough into a uh, hot frying oil and a wok and go like that into a big bowl. Oh, the breads are underrated uh, among the world's great breads. Absolutely. Okay, so when, when I actually go to an Indian restaurant uh, or, or look for Indian takeout, because there are plenty of those here in Southern California now, uh, I basically uh, uh, ask that uh, what, what are dishes without ghee, without uh, yogurt and that. And quite frankly, I'm never disappointed that they have uh, a lot of things for me to choose from. So uh, yes. they seem to be very, very varied in their offerings uh, and have really uh, a lot of vegetarian meals. Yeah, well, remember that largely, not largely, but uh, there are a great deal of, there's a great deal of poverty in mm -hmm. India. So the idea, and they can't eat beef if they're Hindus, but the idea of them having a ready access of lamb, chicken, goats in the poorer areas is just impossible. So um, there's largely vegetarian. And then among uh, Buddhists are largely uh, vegetarians. And I think the Yan, the Jan are, uh, so there are among the hundreds of religions, uh, many vegetarians. I don't hear about vegan so much because as I said, that restaurant that was so rich, they were using dairy throughout. So uh, I think it's more vegetarian than vegan. Hmm. Well, uh, it's an eye opener, but as always, um... Uh, you throw you throw you a, a a random question here and there about food, <laughs> and we know that you're well researched and no no doubt. So thank you very much. My pleasure. For more on celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage. Follow us on Facebook. Subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.